hang out with him a lot more. And you're going to want to do what he wants you to do. And it has driven me to the point to realize when I started out before I was saved, I used to think that God was a cruel taskmaster. In other words, he liked to find you doing things wrong. I now know, after hanging out with God, reading his word, studying it for years, that when I do what he wants me to do, I'm acting in my own best interest. I don't want to do what he wants me to do because I don't know of anybody else that loves me the way he does. The same is true for you, isn't it? Can I get an amen on that? Amen. And so the grace that saves you is the grace that keeps you. So where do we go next? So what's up? What does God want from you? What he wants you to know is this. I'll give this to you now. So spoiler alert, you are God's masterpiece. Created with a purpose and a plan, he decided before time began. You should write that down because it's true. And I want you to remember that you are God's masterpiece. Created with a purpose and a plan that he decided before time began. Listen again to Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. And so again, you are God's masterpiece created with a purpose and a plan he decided before time began. You matter that much to him. And so the second thing I want you to know is that what God is doing in you, what is God doing in you? What I want you to realize, and you can't see it here, it's unusual. Uh, it, let me put it this way. In the Greek language, word order doesn't matter. You don't have, but they don't have the same restrictions we have on word order. If, if I said I, I have to run to the church, you'd say that's good grammar. But if I said, run to the church, I, you'd say, that's bad grammar. Not in Greek. I can do it either way. It doesn't matter. I can flip those words any way I want. But there is something you need to know. That the writer, when they want to emphasize something, will take a word and they'll slide it right to the very front of the sentence. And so what did Paul do here? The very first word in this sentence in our, in our Bible is for. In the Greek Testament, it's he. What Paul wants you to know is you are his workmanship. You're not figuring this out on your own. He's doing it. And so he slid, he, meaning God, he. You are his workmanship. He's working in you. The second thing I want you to know is that this word that we have workmanship here is masterpiece. The NLT defines it that way, and that's a great definition of it. You are his masterpiece. Greek word is poema. We get our word poem from it, but it's something that's being crafted, something that's being crafted by a craftsman. And so God is creating you much as a craftsman would create a crown, something of great importance. God is creating in you a spiritual masterpiece because we wake up in the morning we look in the mirror and we go that ain't no masterpiece there that's for sure <laughs> he's creating in you a masterpiece of who you are in our world we want to look at people and say well you're not looking so young and you're not looking so whatever we're really hooked on the face on the appearances God's concerned with your character and he's working on your character with the precision of a craftsman bringing things into your life to help you and so we might say da vinci had the mona lisa shakespeare had hamlet god has you you're his masterpiece so how's he doing that 
four things that I think of. Four things. One, he does it through prayer. As you get in fellowship with him, as you spend quiet times of prayer with him, as we saw even this morning how God is answering your prayers, our prayers with Patty, and how he's bringing her through this, we're drawing closer to him in fellowship. I've told you that through this time, we're learning things that we otherwise would not have seen. Reading the Bible. 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17 tells us, All scriptures God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so the man of God will be prepared for every good work. And so we know through prayer and through his word that God is forming you. And this is why it's so important for us to be in his word daily because I cannot tell you the amount of times I read something and then I needed it that single day. I find when I get up in the morning, it's almost as if I'm saying to God, I'm a two-year-old, and a two-year-old needs help to get through the parking lot of life safely. And so I'm putting my hand in God's and saying, Lord, I'm going to need direction today. Now, I know in my human arrogance, I can probably handle today on my own, so I think. But you know what? It's a lot more pleasant when God's leading. And so through reading his word, through prayer, a third thing, through suffering. How is God molding you and me? Through prayer, through reading his word, and through suffering. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of all kinds, because you know the testing of your faith develops perseverance. And so God is not afraid to take the chisel of suffering to work into your life those little nuances that we need, need to be mature in him. And sometimes it feels like he's taking great risk. And again, that's one of the things that Patty and I are learning now as we walk through this season of cancer. We're seeing things that God is doing that have amazed us. Do we want to go through more of it? No. If God would have asked us, hey, I'm going to do this, we would have said, no, thank you. Give that to somebody else, please. But he's not afraid because he loves us that much. There's a fourth thing. The fourth thing is time. Have you ever noticed God's not in a hurry? Especially when we're in times of suffering. He's just not in a hurry. Uh, think of Moses. Moses thought he had it all together. He was trained in the best schools in Egypt. He was trained to be king. And he decided he was going to start out as a martyr and start killing people on his own. And it didn't go well. So God put him in time out in the desert. For how long? How long? 40 years. God was not in a hurry. Joseph, his brother sold him into slavery 13 years. He suffered as God prepared him. David suffered after being anointed that he was going to be the king. He was a man on the run for like 10 to 15 years from Saul. Saul had made him public enemy, number one. God was developing these men to be what he wanted them to be. He sees in no hurry. The apostle Paul spent three years in Arabia God is not in a hurry. And so one of the things that Patty and I have been working with this week is to be patient in affliction. To be patient in affliction is what Paul tells us in Romans 12. To be patient in affliction is let God have his way, do what's in front of you, and trust him for the results. And you all know that's really hard to do. I'm going to be patient when things are going my way, but when they're not, no, it's hard to be patient. You see, you are God's workmanship. He's molding you and making you into what he wants you to be right now because he wants to use you today. And he's also molding you in likeness of what he wants you to be forever. So he's molding you to do something with you. So what will God do through you? Well, go back to Ephesians 2.10. We are his 
masterpiece. We have been created in Christ Jesus for good works. Agathos is the word there, which would point us to works that are not only morally good, but beneficial. This is where we get the idea that maybe we should be doing these grandiose works. Maybe we should go on a mission field, or maybe we should do something. You know, I think sometimes it is that, but a lot of times it's the simple things. It's being aware of people around you. It's being aware of needs around you. And Patty and I had the opportunity to sit with another ministry couple um, early in the week. And we didn't need to spend a lot of time with them, but the body language we read was they were broken. They had gone through a really bad hurt. And so we sat and we talked and we prayed with them. It wasn't anything magical. It's, you know what we did? We cared. That's what we did. We paid attention to where we were and we allowed God to guide the conversation and it became very apparent that he had given us a sense when they both started weeping and crying. They were broken and hurt deeply by the church that they were in and now no longer in. It's sometimes very simple. Just God will give you the sense. Just act on it. And we didn't know when we started talking to them how that would go. There might be somebody at the grocery store. All they need is somebody to say hello and smile. I'm surprised the amount of people that do not give you eye contact in the stores. Why? Because nobody seems to really care. Not us. We should be people who care. People who are kind. People who give a smile. People who reach out. Do what we can do. And so we do moral and beneficial. Sometimes it's, it's that simple. It's a sm simple smile to someone or a hello. If Philippians 2.13 says it this way, continue to work out your salvation. Notice it doesn't say work in your salvation. It doesn't say work for your salvation. Work out. Work out your salvation. God is working in you, and that's what he says. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Why? Take God seriously. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. And so you may get the idea to do something. Don't discount that that might be God working through you. He may have given you that idea. Follow it through. See where he goes with it and allow him to have his way. Be available. Where do I get the idea that God is working in you and through you? Galatians 2.20. Listen to what Paul said in Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. The old me is gone. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. And so the way I understand that is Christ wants to live his life through you, as you. Let him. Let him stay in touch through prayer, through the word. Allow him, to, if he brings you into suffering, allow him to have his way. Be patient in affliction. Allow the time because he's developing you for something. And so God has prepared us for good works to do here and now. And it requires our surrender. We have trouble with that. It's tough to surrender. You and I were both taught as good Americans that we need to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. It's the way we were trained. But God doesn't want you to be a good American Christian. He wants you to be a good biblical Christian. And so he wants you to live in dependence on him. Not independent as we have been taught, but when it comes to God, live in dependence on him. It brings me to my fourth point, working out what God has worked in. We've looked at that God is preparing you, that God wants you to do good works, but now he's going to work out through you. The first thing you need to do is you need to be available. You need to be available. Isaiah was available when God brought a calling on his life. 
he was available. Mary, when she learned that she was going to give birth even as a virgin, she was available. She said, may it be to me as you want it to be, Lord. The Apostle Paul, when he was called, he was available to God. And think about it. What higher calling could you have than the God of the universe says, I want this for you. The second thing I want you to do is be available, or other than be available, is be you. Don't try to be anybody else. Be you. God has given you certain abilities and gifts. What do you love to do? It might be God that put that love in your heart to do that. Spend time asking God, God, what would you like for me to do? You've given me gifts, spiritual gifts. You've given me skills and abilities and things I like to do. And if you can find where your passions will cross over and align with your skills, you will find great joy in your life. Great joy. You will want to continue to do it until the Lord calls you home. You see, with Shamgar, it's not a name that we think about too much, but from Judges chapter 3, there's not much said about Shamgar, but let me tell you what he did. Shamgar, you can read it in Judges three, chapter 3, 30, verse 31. He started where he was, and he used what he had. And that's what God's asking you to do. Start where you are, use what you have, and he'll work through you. It, I think of an example that Warren Wearsby tells a story of a, a woman who would visit a, um, a retirement center on a regular basis. And as she would go in there, she would help and assist people. She didn't have to be there. She wasn't visiting a particular person. Well, one day she went there and there was a man just with his head down on the table, not eating. And she walked over to him and she asked him, she said, why aren't you eating? And he said, I can't eat this food. He says, I'm Jewish. I cannot eat this food. And she said, well, what would you like? And he said, what I would really love is just a bowl of hot soup. Well, she went home, and she made him a bowl of hot soup, One came back, got approval to give it to him, and something new started. She started making soup for him and visiting him on a regular basis and befriended him. And then a day came when she got to share Jesus with him, and she led him to Jesus. She was available. She listened. She used what she had, started where she was, and used what she had. That's what God's asking us to do. I see people here doing that. I see Mel doing that with his class. Mel has taken his class steps to take before a loved one dies. His own research that he spent years on and thought, this really helps me. I bet you this would help other people. And now, I don't know how many hundreds, you've taught hundreds how to do that, Mel. And people praise God for Mel. Mel's like, what? I'm just doing what I have. It's not a great sacrifice. Is it joyful for you to do this, Mel? Yes. Could you imagine not doing it now? See, talk to someone that's serving the Lord. This is what, you know, Mel came to me one day and said, I'd like to do this. I said, well, let me check through. We don't, we don't have a ministry for that, Mel. I don't see any ministries like that. It's like, I didn't do that. I said, that's a great idea. Let's do it. And he does it. And God rewards him for it. Um, Doris, you know, Doris is not here today. She's traveling with family, but you know her from the front door. Aunt Doris came to me years ago and said, I'd like to do something here. And I gave her a few things, suggestions, and she, she kind of just got doors slammed in her face, but she didn't give up. Now she is priceless at the front door encouraging people. And if you meet Doris, you're going to be encouraged because that's her gift. She loves to encourage people and she loves being here. How many of us really need a, high, a junior high school principal? I don't think we need one of those. But we got Buddy. <laughs> Buddy tells us it took him over 30 years to get out of middle school. 
his administration gift, he can organize things. And things that you might think are really simple, that's rocket science to me because I'm not a real good organizer. But he stepped up and said, I can help. It's natural to him. and such a big help to me. And who would ever think that I would have a secretary that's a paralegal? I mean, she could do far more than she's doing. And yet, Eileen loves what she does, even though her face is now red. <laughs> I'm sorry. But she uses her gift of administration here and then her gift of teaching here. Would you want to do anything different? No. She loves what she does. See, God has that for you, but I don't know where it is. Find it. What you're searching for is something that will reward you greatly now and forever. And may this be true of you, what is said of David. Now, when David had served God's purpose, did you hear that? Now, when God, David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep and he was buried with his ancestors. Put your name in there. When Keith has served God's purposes in his generation, when you have served God's purposes in your generation, you see, because you are God's masterpiece, he's the one working through you. Let him. I came across this quote. Actually, Patty found it for me. What counts in a man is not what the man can do, but what he actually does. Isn't that true? I know it's simple, but it's so true. I close with this story. There's an old parable that David Jeremiah wrote about. And it was a man who was a farmer who came across an eagle's nest or where an eagle had fallen out of its nest. And so this baby eagle, he picked it up and he took it home and he put it in the barnyard with the chickens. And it grew up with the chickens, learned to eat what chickens eat and it learned to strut around like chickens strut around and basically the eagle had become a chicken. One day, a man was walking by, a biologist, and he recognized that there's the king of birds in there with a bunch of chickens. And he said, explain this to me. And he explained a story to him. And he said, this, I found him as a baby, and I put him in with the chickens, and now he just eats what chickens eat and does what chickens do. He said, doesn't he fly? He said, no, chickens don't fly. The eagle doesn't fly. He's a chicken. And the biologist said, that's the king of all birds. And so he picked the eagle up, and he held it up, and he said, you're the king of all birds. The sky belongs to you. Fly! And the eagle looked around, saw his chicken buddies down there, and he just hopped down and started eating with the chickens again. But the biologist was not going to be discouraged, so he picked the bird up again, took him up to the rooftop, and said the same thing. You're the king of all birds. The sky belongs to you. Fly! And the eagle looked down, and he saw the chickens, and he got down, and he started eating with the chickens again. You see, he was confused. He believed that this was who he was. He didn't realize who he really was. And so the biologist, not to be discouraged, took him up to a mountaintop and said, you're the king of all birds. I want you to fly. The sky belongs to you. And the eagle was worried confused, shaken. He looked up, launched off, and flew away. You see, what we can learn from this is that we're so busy focusing on what we were that we're not looking at who we are. You are God's masterpiece, created by him, with a plan, with a purpose before time began. Say that with me. I am God's masterpiece. 
Say it again. I am God's masterpiece. One more time. I am God's masterpiece. Now look to your left or your right or somebody else and say, you are God's masterpiece. Look the other way. You are God's masterpiece. That is scripture. It is Ephesians 2.10. I, I don't want you to only to say it, but believe it and then get to work. What does God want you to do? Please pray with me. Father, we, by your word, are created by you for good works. And you tell us very clearly in your word that we are your workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which you prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them and live them out today by your glory and to our great joy. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters who are here today that they would not only hear this word, but apply it this week. I pray that you would pierce our hearts and pierce our hearts with your word. That we would recognize that when we obey you, you don't practice with us. You know exactly what you're doing. And so, Lord, I ask that you would have your way with each person here today. In Jesus' name, amen.